Okay, welcome to class two of uh, Introduction to Derivatives. And today we're going to be learning about options. We're going to learn about what options are, um, how they pay off. We're going to learn about put call parity. And we're going to learn about what happens when we combine different options with each other in order to uh, generate quite interesting payoffs. Um, so this week we'll be covering chapters three and four of your textbook. And as I mentioned last week, it does make sense for you to really read through these chapters because there's obviously more detail in the textbook than there will be just if you follow the class on its own. So firstly, let's talk about what an option is and how it differs from a future or from any other derivative. So it is a derivative contract and it relates to a future transaction on an asset. So it's a derivative, it derives its price from an underlying asset, and we plan on transacting on that asset at some point in the future. So, so far, it sounds a lot like a future or forward, and we even have a reference price, a price at which we plan on possibly transacting. The big difference between an option and a future or forward is that the buyer of the option, if you buy an option, you have the right but not the obligation to transact. So there's a choice in there. Instead of, of a future where we've just agreed to transact at a price we've agreed upon today at some point in the future, with an option, one of the two parties to this contract has the right to say, yes, we'll go ahead with this transaction or no, I've decided I don't wish to do this. Uh, I don't, I don't wish to exchange at that price. Now, the buyer gets that right, but not the obligation. And the seller receives money, but incurs the corresponding obligation. So the seller of options does not get to make a choice, just the buyer. And the buyer is paid the seller for this. So options obviously then do cost money to buy at inception. So if you're buying an option, you are paying for it. You're paying an amount of money that we call the option premium in order to buy that option. And if you're selling an option, you receive that premium. Um, so it, it's quite different to futures and forwards where in a future or forward, we just agreed to a transaction at a price that seems fair right now, but to transact at some point in the future. In this case, we have agreed that one of the two parties may or may not choose to transact. The other is required to, to do whatever the, the first party, the buyer of the option says um, at expiration and that they are paid money by the buyer of the option in order to incur that obligation. So that's basically what an option is. It's not too complicated. And then we have two types of option. We have a put option and a call option. So they both fall under that earlier definition, but a put option, the buyer of a put option has the right, but not the obligation to sell the underlying at the strike price at expiration. And the seller of that put option has the obligation to buy the underlying from the put option buyer uh, should they decide so at expiration. A call option, uh, the buyer of a call option has the right but not the obligation to buy the underlying from the seller of the call option at expiration should they choose to, and the seller of a call option just incurs that obligation. So really the difference here between a put option and a call option is that one is when you, a put option is when the buyer has the right to sell, and a call option is when the buyer has the right to buy the underlying at some point in the future. And as I explained earlier, this is the right but not the obligation to sell or buy. And the, the seller of these options only incurs obligations, but for that they do receive a premium. Okay, so when we skip on to the next slide, you can see here that we have our two types of options. We have call options and put options. And you can choose to either buy or sell those. So there's 
four positions really that you're able to take. Uh, you can be the buyer of a call option, the buyer of a put option, the seller of a call option, or the seller of a put option. And so with these four different possible options transactions that you can make, uh, some are bullish and some are bearish. Now the term bullish means that a person is bullish if they expect the price of the underlying to go up and plan to profit from that, and they are bearish if they expect the price of the underlying to fall and plan to profit from that. So for this slide, we've put in little icons of bulls and bears to help you see uh, the, the viewpoints of the various option traders. Now, once again, with these options, like the futures, for every buyer, there is a seller. So if you are buying a call option, someone has sold that call option to you. So the buyer of the call option, as we can see here on the first line, is bullish. And the seller of the call option is bearish or neutral in that they're happy if the price uh, goes sideways or falls. Um, the buyer of the call option really just wants the price to go up and up and the more it goes up the more money they make. Then when we move down to put options, you can see that the buyer of the put option is bearish. We've got the little bear icon there. And they would like the price to fall and the more the price falls, the more money they make. The seller of that put option is bullish. They would like the price to rise, but equally they're happy enough if it doesn't rise, if it just stays where it is. So as you can see, with our options, the buyers usually are either quite bullish or quite bearish. They'd like it to rise and they make more and more money the more it rises, or they'd like it to fall and they make more and more money the more it falls. In both cases, when we talked about the sellers, we said that they were either bearish or bullish or neutral. And the reason for that is because they receive premium and the most money they can make is the premium they received from the buyer of those options. And so even if they are, we'll say for example, the seller of a call option might be bearish, but they don't necessarily make any more money if it falls a lot or if it falls a little, but they do lose money if the price rises. And similarly with the seller of put options, options. They're bullish, but they don't necessarily make any more money just because it rises a lot rather than if it rises a little or stays at the same price. So that's the concept of being bullish and bearish. And those are the four positions that we could have with our two types of options, the two options being either calls or puts. So as we move on to our next slide, there's also two subclasses of those options, which are American options and European options. An American option you can exercise early, while a European option you can only exercise at the expiration date. So the American option, the buyer of the American option can exercise it at any point. We'll say if it's a three month option, it expires in three months. The buyer of that American option is able to exercise it at any point should they choose. The European option buyer can only exercise it on one date and that is at the date of expiration. Now, if we think a little bit about it, the American option is going to be worth a little bit more than the European option simply because it has more flexibility. And obviously, if you buy something that has more features, is more flexible, it's going to cost a little bit more. So for our American options, they cost a little bit more usually than a European option with all else being the same. We move on to our next slide, options traders. And for every owner of an option, there must be a seller. I've said this already, and this is the same with most of our derivatives. Um, so for anyone who buys a call option, they're buying it from someone who is selling that call option. Uh, for anyone who buys a put option, they are buying it from someone who is selling that put option. So we have these four possible positions, which is long a call, short a call, long a put, short a put. And as you can see, Whenever you're long, whenever you bought the option, you have the right but not the obligation. And whenever you have sold an option, be it a put or a call, you have the obligation. You, you have to follow the decision of the buyer of that option. 
So on our next slide, we have a slide that you saw last week, which is the payoff diagram of if you are long the underlying asset. And so as you can see here, it's a straight line. It's a linear relationship. And after that, we have the payoff diagram of short the underlying asset. And once again, that's a linear relationship. Now, as we move on to our next slide, the call buyer payoff, you can see here that we've got a bend in our line. So at the strike price, the agreed upon price, should the price go up and up and up, our call buyer is going to exercise that option and they will profit from it. Now, should the price fall or stay the same, it wouldn't really make sense for them to to exercise that option. Now, as you can see, the line, the flat part of the line is at the bottom of the chart or it's below that zero point in the payoff. And the reason for that is because they've paid out money in order to buy this call option. So we'll say if they bought this this call option will say if the strike price is a hundred and they paid a dollar to buy this call option, they needed to move up by a dollar in order to break even. So that line there where the two lines cross, that is our break even point. And after that, the call buyer is making profit. So the more it goes up, the more money it makes. If it falls, they've truncated, they've cut off their losses and the most that they can lose, the most that the buyer of this call option can lose is the amount of money that they paid in premium. So that's their worst case scenario is losing the premium that they paid. If we move down to the next slide, you see the call sellers payoff. And this is really the opposite of what we've just looked at. They've got the exact opposite bet because these two traders are facing each other. So the more the price of the underlying rises in this example, the more money that our call seller is losing. If the price stays the same or falls, they're profitable, they're above that zero point on the line, and they get to keep the premium. So as you can see here, the call seller, the most that they can make is the premium. They get to take in the premium, and if the price stays the same or falls, they get to keep it. Should the price rise, they start to lose money. They once again have a a break-even point, and we'll say with the last example where we said the strike price was 100 and the call cost a dollar, that means that once the underlying goes to $101, they're at break even. If it rises any further than that, they start to lose money and they lose it in a linear manner as the underlying goes up. So that is the payoff of a call option from either the buyer or the seller's perspective. Then we move on to a put buyer. Now, if you remember a put is the right to sell the underlying. So if you buy a put, you have the right to make someone buy the underlying from you at the strike price. So as you can see here, our put buyer has paid premium. So if the underlying goes up, it's not worth exercising the put and they have their maximum loss, which is the amount that they paid out in premium. Now, if the underlying falls, if the stock price falls, uh, firstly, we hit the break even and, and it has to fall by the amount of premium that you paid in order for you to break even. And then after that, you make more and more money. The maximum you can make is if the stock price falls to zero. So that is the payoff for a buyer of a put option. Then if we look at the put seller's payoff on our next slide, we can see that it is the opposite. The most money you can make selling a put option is the premium that you received. So best case scenario, you get to keep all of the premium. You make the maximum loss if the underlying falls to zero. And so obviously as a seller of a put, you're hoping that the price of the underlying either stays the same or goes up. And so as you can see, when you look back and forth between the buyer and seller of a call and the buyer and the seller of a put, they have the exact opposite payoff. So whatever amount of money the buyer of a call makes, the seller of that call loses and the same for puts. So finally, we have our four payoffs put 
all together on one chart with our little bull and bear icon. So you can see that there are quite distinct payoffs available to buyers and sellers of puts and calls. And this is what makes options attractive to investors, is that you get to really define the risk that you're taking, and you get to define the type of payout that you would like. This is quite different than just buying a stock and hoping that the price rises, or even shorting a stock and hoping that the price falls. With with these truncated payoffs that you get with options, and you can choose to either be a buyer or a seller of a put or a call, you get quite different payoff profiles that are not really available in the market without trading options. Okay, so now that you understand what a put and a call are, and how the buyers and sellers uh, make or lose money, we're going to move on to looking at the details that are going to be specified in our options contract. So the first thing is the strike price of the option. And the strike price, which is also referred to as the exercise price of an option, is the price at which it can be exercised. Strike prices are fixed in the contract. For calls, the strike price is the price where the underlying can be bought up until the exercise date. And for put options, it's the price at which the underlying can be sold. So that is the strike price, and obviously it's a very important price uh, when we're looking at options. The next thing is the expiration, and this is the date on which the options contract expires. So uh, an options contract always does expire. They're, they're not infinite contracts. So usually you might see them as being one month, three month, six month, nine month contracts. And once they expire, the option holder, the buyer of the option, must either exercise it or allow it to expire worthless. So that is the expiration date. The next thing we're going to talk about is what's called intrinsic value and time value. So the intrinsic value of an option is its value if it was exercised immediately. So we'll say, for example, if there is a call option, which gives us the right but not the obligation to buy the underlying at expiration date. And the strike price of this call option is 100, but the underlying is trading at 105. So what that means is we have the right, but not the obligation. We're allowed to buy it from the seller of that call option for $100, even though the underlying right now is trading at $105. So we would say that that option obviously has a minimum value of $5, right? Because if you exercised it right away, you would make a $5 profit from the contract. So that is the intrinsic value. Now, because there is still time to go on that option, the option will always usually trade above its intrinsic value. So we'll say, for example, if that option where the strike price is at 100 and the underlying is trading at 105, that option in the real world might be worth, we'll say, $6. And we would say then that that option has an intrinsic value of $5, as just explained, and that it has a time value of $1, which is the option premium less the uh, intrinsic value. So the time value of the option is the amount a rational investor would pay in excess of the intrinsic value based on the potential that the underlying can increase more in value before expiration date. So that is intrinsic value and time value. And then we move on to our slide on moneyness. And moneyness is a term that option traders use. And they'll refer to options as being either in the money, at the money, or out of the money. So an in the money option is an option that has positive intrinsic value. So our last option that we said where it was a call option with a strike of 100 and the underlying is at 105, that has intrinsic value of five dollars or we could also say that it is five dollars in the money now if the strike price was equal to the price of the underlying 
then we would call that an at the money option. So if, if it's an option with a strike of 100 and the underlying is trading at 100, we'd call that an at the money option. And then finally, an out of the money option is an option that has no intrinsic value and only time value. So using a call as an example, a call option with a strike price of 100 when the underlying is trading at 95, it doesn't have any intrinsic value, but it still will have some value because the fact that there is that truncated payoff means that an option is always worth something because there might be months to go in which it could at some point rise above a hundred dollars and suddenly become valuable. So that's an out of the money option. Just because it's out of the money does not mean it's worth nothing. It's worth something, but all of its value is time value. Okay, so let's move on to our next slide. And our next slide is about underlyings. And there are numerous different possible underlyings for options. And we have this definition on the screen um, from the Financial Accounting Standards Board. But essentially, an option can have any kind of underlying. We've talked a lot about things like, uh, you know, stocks, uh, equities, um, but it, they can be based upon bonds. They can be based upon interest rates. They can even be based on other derivatives. So you can have an option on a future. You can have an option on a swap. Really anything any price that's observable in the market or tradable, you can, you, you can structure an options contract on. So there's all kinds of underlyings for options. Our next slide, dividend. So what happens to a stock price when a dividend is paid? And this is an important point. We'll say if there's a stock that's trading at $100 and we know that tomorrow they're going to pay a $1 dividend what would you expect to happen to the stock price? Now, this may not be initially intuitive to you, but you would expect the stock price to fall by $1. And the reason for that, all other things being equal, is that if the company is worth $100 and within that company there is some cash, they're paying out that cash to the investors as a dividend. It really means that they're taking one dollar out of their bank account, giving it to you as the investor. So the company is now worth one dollar less and you as an investor have one dollar in your hand. So whenever a dividend is paid, you would expect the stock price to fall by the amount of the cash dividend paid, all other things being equal. Now, options contracts are not adjusted for cash dividends. They are adjusted for special dividends, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But for a normal dividend, there is no adjustment made to an options contract. Um, now, as an owner of an option, if you bought a call option or bought a put option, as we've said, these are derivatives. They, they're not issued by the company. They're side bets on the value of that underlying stock. And so an options owner or a, a derivative owner will say, for example, a futures owner does not receive any of these dividends. They are paid out. They are the earnings of the company being paid out to investors in the company. As an options or a futures investor, you are simply speculating on the price of that. So when a dividend is going to be paid, normally companies announce these well in advance and you're, as an investor, aware the dividends will be paid. And so you would expect that to be taken into account by options investors when they price the option to begin with. So then we move on to stock splits. And Stock splits are when a company decides to give you more shares in the company. Now, we'll say if there's a company, we'll have a very simple idea of a company where it's made up of a 100 shares with a 100 investors. Now, if each of those investors was given two shares in exchange for the one share they already had, really what happens is just that they have twice as many shares, but they'll be worth half as much because they're just proportional ownership in the company. So a stock split really just is a thing that happens because companies like to keep 
their stock price trading in a certain range. If the price just kept going up and up, it would make it difficult for regular investors to buy or sell shares in the company. We'll say, for example, if if a, a share in a company cost $200,000, it would make it prohibitively expensive for everyday investors to put some of their retirement money into that company. So companies keep splitting the stocks every few years when the price goes up in order to um, to keep the price trading in a certain price range. So option strikes are adjusted for this. So as you can see here on our slide, an N for M stock split causes the stock price to fall to M over N of its prior value. Now, that may sound confusing, so let's throw in numbers. A two-for-one stock split causes the stock price to fall to half of its prior value. The option strike is then adjusted to half of the previous value. So we'll say if it was a call option with a strike price of 100, it's now going to be two call options with a strike price of 50, and therefore everything remains the same. The number of shares, as I just mentioned, changed to N over M. So, so you have twice as many, in our example, shares that are covered by your options contract. This adjustment leaves options neutral pre and post split. So there's really, it just makes it fair on both options buyers and sellers, because essentially, Nothing real has happened with the company, and therefore it wouldn't be reasonable for uh, one of the options investors to profit based on uh, a stock split occurring. So that's how the options contract is adjusted. We'll move on now to position limits. And so much like with futures, options exchanges specify position limits. And these are just to prevent the market been unduly influenced by one investor or group of investors. So you're not allowed to build up a massive position in options on an underlying uh, with, with the goal of essentially controlling the price of that underlying. And the position limits will vary. So with a very liquid contract, uh, the, you, you might be allowed to take quite a large dollar exposure. And with something very illiquid or thinly traded, you would not be allowed to take as big of a position. And that makes, I guess, obvious sense. Options margin. So we talked last week about futures margin and margin is collateral that you have to deposit to cover some or all of the credit risk. Only option sellers have to post margin. And the reason for this is that buyers of options, if you buy a put or if you buy a call, you pay the entire amount. It's usually not an awful lot of money. You pay that and you have the right but not the obligation. And the most you can lose is that amount. So it doesn't make sense for you to have to put up any additional margin because there's really no additional money you can lose other than the amount of money you paid in premium. Now, the sellers can obviously lose rather large amounts of money and much more than the amount of money they've received in premium. So they do have to post margin and they will have to top up that margin much like a futures trader does. If they're losing money, they'll have to bring that back up to maintenance uh, margin in order to reduce the risk of them causing problems for their broker or for the, the clearing house. So our next slide here is on naked options positions. And this is just a term that's used. A naked position is when a trader sells an option contract without holding an offsetting position in the underlying security. So for example, you could have what we call a covered position, which is the opposite of a naked position. And we'll say, for example, if you owned stock and you sold some call options on it. So you sold away some of the upside on that underlying. Now, should the price go up and up and up, you're not really as risky a counterparty because 
Sure, you're losing more and more and more money on your call option, but your stock that you own is going up and up and up in value in a linear manner with that. So you have a covered position and the exchange will take that into account uh, when calculating the margin. And they will see that because you actually own the underlying and the price is going up and up and up, they're not going to ask you for nearly as much as much margin as if you had sold a call option but did not own any of the underlying. So um, margin calculations are more favorable to investors who are covered um, because losses are potentially much higher on naked sales of options. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Options exercise. So we talked about this a little bit earlier and the buyer of the option is the only one who can exercise. They have the right to exercise. And once they've done this, the contract is terminated. So with a European option, they can only do this at expiration anyhow. But with an American option, they can obviously do this early. But once they have exercised the option, um, the delivery will be made to them and There's no more options contract. It disappears. It's no longer valid once the option has been exercised. Then we move on to clearing and clearing. We talked about the clearing house last week for futures and there is also a clearing house for options. It's called the OCC or the Options Clearing Corporation and they act as a clearing house for US options markets and there will be different clearing houses for different uh, options markets around the world. And once again, the clearinghouse provides a central counterparty clearing and settlement services to the various exchanges. And they do all of the administration. So when you exercise your option, if you own an option and you exercise it, they use, especially if it's an American option and it's early exercised, they will then use some sort of a lottery to decide who that option has been exercised or assigned against and they will go to them and ask them to uh, to perform what they their function on exercise so that is the OCC and equally both buyers and sellers of options are facing the OCC and they are posting the sellers of the options are posting margin to the OCC so as a buyer or a seller of options, we don't really have to worry about counterparty risk because our counterparty is the clearing house. So that is really most of what we need to know about options, uh, call options and put options, how they work and so on. So now we're going to move on to warrants. And warrants are a new derivative. They're an awful lot like call options, but they are different. So let's talk about how they're different. They are similar to call options. They trade in secondary markets, just like call options, but they are issued by the underlying company. So they're part of the capital structure of the company. So all of our other, our call options were issued by the exchange and one person buys it, one person sells it, and they're offsetting, they're facing each other. With a warrant, it's like a call option that is issued by the company. And so the the money that comes in, the premium actually goes to the company, the underlying company. And then should the stock price go up and up and up and they're eventually exercised, the company has to issue new shares. So we call that dilution, that that these uh, warrants are dilutive in that the company actually, they don't go out in the market and buy some stock and deliver it to to the, the person who exercised their warrant. They actually issue new stock. So more stock is out there after a warrant has been exercised. Another big difference is they typically have much longer maturities than a call option. So they might have three or five year maturities with a warrant, while with most of our calls and puts, they've quite short, you know, three month, six month, nine month maturities. So that's warrants. The next thing we're going to talk about are convertible bonds. So a convertible bond is a bond that's issued by a company. So it's issued in order to raise money for the company to raise capital. And it is a bond that can be converted into stock. 
So it's a type of bond that the holder can convert into a specified number of shares of stock in the issuing company if it is exercised. So these, once again, it's a bond that contains a warrant within it. Now, once again, when a convertible bond is exercised, the bond no longer exists. So you give up your bond and you receive stock. So there's once again this issue of dilution, much like warrant. So it's priced as like a bond with a warrant embedded in it rather than a bond with a call option embedded in it. Um, employee stock options are the same. Employee stock options are often used to compensate employees. If you work for a big company, maybe they give you some stock options every year as part of your pay package. You can eventually cash those employee stock options. You can exercise them and receive stock in the company, but the company doesn't just go out and buy those in the market. They usually issue new stock. So once again, employee stock options are dilutive. And with both our convertible bonds and employee stock options, they tend to have much longer maturities than, uh, than, than a simple call or put might have. So that is, they are all types of option or types of derivative. So let's move on and think a little bit about what is going to impact the price of uh, an option. So there's some really obvious things. The current stock price is fairly obvious and obviously also the strike price agreed upon. The time to maturity will affect the value of options. The volatility of the stock price, now that, that has a rather important impact on the price of the option, and we'll talk about that much more in the coming weeks. The risk-free interest rate will impact the value of the option as well. And finally, dividends expected over the life of the option. So let's talk about our first thing, the spot price, the price of the underlying. Long call options are obviously more valuable when the underlying spot price goes up, when it increases. And long put options become more valuable when the underlying spot price decreases. And that should be pretty obvious to you based on how they pay out. Um, the next thing is the strike price. Now, the contracted price that will be exchanged in the event of the exercise of the option is what the strike price is. And so obviously the level of the strike price will be very important in determining whether an option is valuable or not very valuable. Next is time to maturity. The more time there is on an option, the more things that can happen, the greater the uncertainty that exists is. So the more time there is, the more valuable an option is. And let's talk a little bit about that. Let's say, for example, if there's a stock that's trading at $100 right now, and I said to you that I will sell you a call option on this stock with a strike price of 200. So it only really starts to accrue value as after the price of this stock has doubled. Now, if I said to you that that option is going to expire in 10 minutes time, you might say, well, I'm not really going to buy that from you because it seems improbable to me that a stock price is going to double in the next 10 minutes. Now, if I said to you, that it would in expire instead in 20 years' time, you might think, well, actually, that seems like a reasonably valuable option because over 20 years, it's quite reasonable to expect the, the underlying to double in value. So it's quite obvious when you look at the extremes like that, that the more time there is to maturity, the more valuable an option should be. Volatility. So the more volatile a stock is, the more likely it is to move either up or down quite a lot. So the, an underlying, we'll say, that is very volatile might be a technology company, for example, where the earnings could either be huge in the next year or they might be terrible, and we really just don't know. And so we use standard deviation to measure volatility in finance. And obviously, the more volatile a company is, the more options will be worth. And that's both call options or put options because a volatile 
stock in an exciting industry can move a lot in either direction. Now, a very dull company, one with very low volatility, might move very little on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, the less volatile the underlying is, the less an option is going to be worth simply because it would be quite unexpected for that stock price to move an awful lot in a given period of time. So that's volatility. And then finally, we have here interest rates. In finance, we're always going to discount any sort of expected cash flow. That's one of the most basic concepts in finance, that a dollar in a year's time is not worth a dollar today. And so interest rates will impact options value simply because we're talking about future payments, uh, future transactions with an option. And then we have here expected dividends. And so dividends, we talked about this earlier, paid on an underlying over the life of an options contract are going to reduce the price of the underlying. And this has to be reflected in the price of an option. So if we had two identical companies, everything is about them is identical. And we have two identical options, one on each of these companies. Now, if the only difference is that one of these companies pays a dividend and the other doesn't, we would expect the options prices to be different simply because of that difference, because one of these stocks is going to have a bit of a drag on it because it keeps paying dividends. And every time it pays a $1 dividend, you would expect the price of that stock to fall by a dollar. Um, so that is dividends. Right, so that's, that is a pretty good run through of what options are and a few other things like warrants and uh, employee stock options and so on. So now what we're going to look at is a few trading strategies. We're going to look at how people might trade options. Um, there's many things that they can do. So let's look at firstly what happens if you combine an option with a position in the underlying. So. We've already touched a little bit upon this, but let's talk about a covered call. So a covered call is when you're long the stock. That means that you own the underlying stock and you've sold a call on that stock. So really what's happened is we'll say if the stock is trading at 100 and you've sold some call options with a strike price of 105, what you think is you, you like owning the stock, maybe you've owned it for a while and you think it's probably even going to go up, but you doubt that it'll go up much more than $5. And maybe you feel that if it went up $5 or more, you'd be happy to sell it. So in order to bring in a little income from that opinion, you've decided to sell a call. So you're long a stock, you've sold a call and you've, you've brought in this premium. You've received a premium from selling the call. And that is a covered call. And that might be a reasonable trading strategy for an investor. Now, our next trading strategy is called a protective put. A protective put is when you buy the underlying stock or you, you already own it. And then you buy a put, which is the right to sell that. And you, you're buying that as a form of protection. So you own the stock, but should the price fall an awful lot, you get to make someone buy it from you at a better price than is available in the market right now. So that's another strategy that an investor could follow um, in trading options, which is not really available if you're just a single stock investor, for example. Now, if we move on to the next slide, you can see the payoffs of those things. So at the top, we have the straight line there, the straight heavy line, which is the payoff of being long the underlying long the stock. And then because we've sold a call, the dotted line is short a call. Now, when you combine those together, you end up with the payoff that you see in the top right hand corner, which is the payoff of a covered call. And if you look at that, you'll notice that it looks a little bit like the payoff of another options position that we've talked about earlier. It looks an awful lot like being short a put. Now, then we move down and we see what happens with our protective put. So we're long the stock, which is that heavy black line, 
and then we are long a put, which is the dashed line underneath. And when you combine the payoff of those two assets together, you end up with a payoff that's like the little chart on the right. And once again, you can see here that this looks like the payoff of one of our other simple options positions. It looks like being long a call option. So it's kind of interesting that that happens. And if we look at other combinations, so we'll say, for example, if you are short the stock and short a put, you end up with a payoff that looks like being short a call option. Or if you are long a call and short the stock, you end up with a payoff that looks like being long a put option. So whenever we combine an option with a position, be it long or short, in the underlying, you end up with a payoff that looks an awful lot like the payoff of a different type of option. So we have a formula then that explains these relationships, and that formula is referred to as the put-call parity formula. And put-call parity defines the relationship between the price of a European call option and a European put option as long as they have the same strike price and the same expiration. So it only applies to European puts and calls and ones that have the same strike price and the same expiration date. It does require that there be a liquid tradable underlying, that, that it's easy to buy and sell the underlying, and it does other than that, really require very minimal assumptions. It's, and if we go to the next slide, we'll see the formula for put call parity. And it, as you can see here, it's put, it's a lowercase p, which means a European put, plus S0, which is the spot price at time zero, so right now, is equal to lowercase c, which is a European call option, plus Ke to the negative RT, and that is the present value of, a, of the strike. So a put plus the spot is equal to a call plus the present value of the strike. And then on our next slide, we can see that you can just do a little bit of algebra and see that a, the spot is equal to the call minus the put plus the present value of the strike, that a put is equal to a call minus the spot plus the present value of the strike, and so on. And should these um, put call parity does have to hold, and it does hold in the market, because if you can have a portfolio, if you have two portfolios that have the exact same payout, they do have to be priced the same. Otherwise, there would be an arbitrage opportunity. So that is put call parity. Okay, and then we move on to combination strategy. So we've looked at what happens when you combine an option with the underlying, but there are all sorts of strategies that involve combining one option with another. So the first type that we're going to look at are called spreads. And a spread is entered by buying and selling options of the same class on the same underlying, but with either different strike prices or different expiration dates. If a spread profits from the rise of the price of the underlying, we call that a bull spread because bullish uh, it refers to the price going up. And if it profits from a fall in the price of the underlying, we call that a bear spread. Um, so our first chart that we're going to look at here on the next slide is called a bull call spread. And a bull call spread is assembled by buying one call option with a low exercise price and selling another call option with a higher exercise price. So if we think a little bit about how this works, if we bought a call option, as, as you can see in the diagram there, we've bought the call option with the strike K1, and we've sold a call option with the strike price K2. So as long as the price is between those, as it's above K1, we start to make money. But once it passes through K2, the second strike price, the second option is sort of neutralizing the first one. So we stop making any additional money after that. 
So when you look at a payoff like that, it might be quite an interesting payoff to an investor where we'll say, for example, they feel that the price is going to rise, but they equally feel it's not necessarily going to rise forever. They might think, we'll say if it's trading at 100 right now, that they think it's going to go up, but they don't necessarily think it's going to go up more than 50%, for example. So they could buy a call option with a strike price of 100 and sell a call option with a strike price of 150. And at least they've gotten a little bit of money back in selling that second call option. So it's cheaper to buy one call and sell a higher price call than it is to just have bought that one call option. So that is a spread. Now obviously if the price of the underlying doubles, you don't profit as much as if you had uh, just owned a call option, but equally you didn't spend as much money in premium in order to take that position. Okay, so if we look at the example of the bull spread on the next slide, you can see here that we've got two options available. There's a call option that expires in a month and it has a strike price of 220. And there's another call option that expires in a month as well. And it has a strike price of 235. So what we've decided to do is to buy the call option with the strike price of 220 and then sell the call option with the strike price of 235. Now, the first call costs $12 and the second call, the out of the money call, costs $8. So we are paying $12, receiving $8. So the overall position is costing us $4 to implement. So what that means is that in order to be profitable, the underlying has to move at least $4 above the strike of our first call. So our break-even point here, where the payout line crosses the uh, zero barrier, is at $224. Now, as it goes up, we make more and more money. Now, the most money that we can make is $11. And the $11 comes from if we take 235 minus 220, that gives us $15. But then because we paid $4 for the call option, that brings it down to 11. So the most money you can make on this is 11. And the most money that you can lose on this trade is $4. So that is a bull spread and how it works and why an investor might want to, to trade that. Now on the next slide, we have a bear spread and we have a bear put spread, which involves buying one put option and selling the same number of lower strike price put options on the same security with the same expiration date. So as you can see there on our chart, there's two put options. One has a strike price of K1 and the other has a strike price of K2. So we're buying the put option with a strike of K2 and selling the put option with a strike of K1. And then we get the payoff that with the heavy black line there of a bear spread. So let's look at an example of that. So similar numbers to our last slide. The stock is priced at $240. There are two put options out there. Expiring next month, there's a 220 strike put, which costs $8, and a 240 strike put, which costs $12. You can buy the $12 put, sell the $8 put, so the overall spread costs us $4. And then this is profitable if the stock closes below 236. So that is 240 minus 4, which is the amount we spent in options premium, gives us our break-even price. The more it falls, the more we make money until it goes through our next strike, which is 220. And after that, the amount of money that we can make is capped. So the most money we can make on this is $16, and the most money we can lose is $4, which is the amount that we paid out in premium. So that's a bear spread. A bull spread can be created using either puts or calls. And equally, you can put together a bear spread using either puts or calls. And that's just due to put call parity. And if you take a look in your textbook, you'll be able to see how that works. 
So our next spread, our next type of trade is called a butterfly spread. And a butterfly spread is a limited risk, non-directional option strategy. The trader sells two options contracts at the middle strike, buys one contract at a lower strike, and buys one contract at a higher strike. And if we look at the next page at the payout, you can see how this works. So we've bought one call at K1, we've bought one call at K3, and we've sold two calls at K2. And the payout is that heavy black line that you can see. And as you can see there, the maximum payout from this butterfly spread is if the underlying closes, if at expiration the stock price is at K2. So essentially this is a bet that the underlying will not move very much for us. Then we move on to a straddle, and a straddle is an option strategy where the investor buys both a call and a put with the same strike price and same expiration date. It's called a long straddle if you buy both of them, and it's referred to as a short straddle if you sell both. Let's look at the payout of that. So with our straddle, we in this example, it's a long straddle. So we've bought a put and we've bought a call. And what does that mean? It means that we think the underlying is either going to move up an awful lot or down an awful lot, but we really don't know which. So we're buying both options. In truth, what we think is that the market is likely, the market in this underlying, it's likely to move a lot more than other people think it's likely to move. And so we bought both a put and a call. We think that it's going to be quite volatile. So a long straddle, when you buy a straddle, you're betting that there's going to be high volatility. If you sell a straddle, you're betting that there's going to be low volatility, that the underlying is not going to move an awful lot in either direction. Our final options trading strategy is called a strangle, and it's very similar to a straddle in that if you were long a strangle, you've bought both a call and a put on the same underlying with the same maturity. But the difference between a strangle and a straddle is that with a strangle, we have two different strike prices. And it allows the holder, once again, to profit based on how much the price of the underlying security moves with relatively minimal exposure to the direction of the price movement. So a strangle buyer believes that the underlying is going to move a lot. They don't necessarily know the direction. And once again, if you're selling a strangle, you are betting that it's not going to move that much. When we look at the payoff diagram, it's similar but different to uh, to the payoff of a straddle. And really, it's just that you're buying usually an out-of-the-money call and an out-of-the-money put. So our strangle is going to cost less to buy than the straddle will, but it possibly requires more of a move. So it's really just a balance of how much you're paying out in premium against how much you expect the underlying to move. So that is our options combination.